thanks for getting up early because Berlin, in my experience, is a difficult city to have a long night's sleep. It tends to drag on. Uh, so you're here early in the morning. That's great. And apologies because you will not see a lot of flash images or interesting technical developments. I will leave that to others. Uh, instead, in some sort of brilliant bit of programming, the organizers brought me to start the conference to just take a huge dump squid and just drop it on the proceedings. Uh, so there's two outcomes. One is you might sit through this and say, yeah, I don't care, irrelevant. The other is it might give you some things to think about, and maybe at the end of it, if you're able to tick the box that you've thought about all of this, this might be good. So, um, Henny, control yourself. Yeah. Uh, this is Peter Sagan, if you don't know. He's an exceptional cyclist, and uh, I want you to have in mind the idea of someone who rides on equipment that is accessible to anyone else in the team, or indeed, if you have a lot of money, you could buy a bicycle like this, but there's no way you could ever reach his performance. He is off the scales in terms of natural skill, and keep that in mind. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about while I try to get my presenter notes... Here, there we are. Okay, good. Uh, can we play? There we are. We had to swap computers. Uh, I have no particular reason showing this, but I like the animation. That was a brilliant piece of branding. But uh, I did have a question about the theme of the conference because I thought, how far can we go? Is something that pushes people to think about how much can we push the technology and what can we do with this new toy that we've got? And I thought maybe that's not what we should be thinking about, and we should engage in a bit of reflection. At the heart of my uh, thesis is that typefaces are not about design. Uh, typefaces really are a business proposition, and if you think about them from the design point of view, you're sort of missing the point. Uh, and I'm saying this especially in an audience where I shouldn't need to emphasize this too much because hopefully a lot of you are paying your rent through typefaces. Uh, so I'm going to give you some things that reflect on the industry. Uh, and since you mentioned Typotechnica, that, that shows our age, because it was there. Um, it's about 20 years ago that we had OpenType and Unicode really hitting the mainstream in terms of adoption. That was not because they were not around before or were not available to people. It's because there was a shift in the way people use documents that required some interchange and different way of using platforms for documents that required the technologies uh, that enabled text to survive uh, transmission. It is interesting that in markets where uh, operating, the typography was operating in a closed environment, there was a delayed adoption. So if you look, for example, in the Middle East, there was a much delayed adoption of uh, Unicode technologies exactly because there was no need for it. So the presence of a technology doesn't necessarily ensure its adoption unless there is a need for it. Uh, I had to show this. Uh, the technology also allowed us to do a lot of interesting and cool things with open type fonts, have very large character sets and have features that allow you to have 11 ampersands and 14 different uh, parentheses in your font. We know very well that these are not being used. And if the font technology had the intelligence in it for Adobe to query, for example, how many times people go and select uh, the 11th ampersand that uh, a font has in, we would know very well that there is a very low probability that this is used by any designer. So there might be issues of interface there. Yes, you can make something accessible. We do not really know that actually an easier interface has enabled people to use a wider character set in terms of the alternative glyphs. We can also track this by the kind of discussions people are having. So if you look across many years, this is not just this recently, people talk about the technology that we experience as OpenType as a Unicode font, because it's the bit that survives across platforms and will enable you to send your documents uh, across to your distributor service bureaus and so on, rather than the features. This kind of discussion has also parallels in the market of mobile technologies. So if you look at the kind of discussions that are happening around the adoption of new technologies in the mobile, mobile networks, then the discussions between 3G and 4G, and now the much delayed introduction to 5G, they relate a lot to the discussion we're having about new steps in technology for fonts. So they are enabling technologies that only actually get adopted when there is evidence of a demand by a community of users that will introduce them into new behaviors. Uh, I'm going to get annoying now. We can see the same thing in our own backyard with the change in type design applications. Uh, 
So for many years, we had just a couple of applications that people mostly used. Some people still use the top two applications. Um, then we had the long desert years of mostly FontLab. Uh, a, with all love and care to the people who make it, a not very user-friendly application uh, which created certain barriers in actually doing things efficiently. And then, very quickly, we had uh, in rapid succession introduction of new applications that were much more flexible and allowed many more people to do type design. We've also had completely free uh, environments and now we have another font lab as well which pretends to be easy. Now, here's the interesting thing. <laughs> Somebody must have seen it somewhere. Yeah. The interesting thing is that if you look at the quality of typefaces produced during these years, you do not have a significant increase in the top quality of typefaces. If you look at what gets awarded, what is successful, what people value in terms of design quality, people can produce excellent typefaces with difficult applications, with clunky applications, with slow applications. What has changed is the entry level. So easier applications, especially glyphs, have enabled a lot of new entrants into the bottom end of the market. So what we have is a growth of the bottom of the market, and since the crappy fonts yeah, uh, are now much easier to achieve, and also mediocrity is much easier to achieve because you automate a lot of functions. So a lot of errors that somebody might have done through a difficult application are now automated or now made easier to solve. So you have a shifting of the lower end of the market up, a much ballooning section in the middle, but you don't have a significant change in the top. People who are producing excellent fonts with difficult applications are still producing excellent fonts with easier to use applications. And that tells us something that technology might be enabling in some factors, but it is not a significant change in the environment on its own. There are also interesting regional variations in this. So you can see in the West, where there's an oversupply of typefaces, actually the ability to produce typefaces more quickly or easily doesn't necessarily shift the perception. This is Rudolf Bartmettler complaining about the oversupply of typefaces two weeks ago. Uh, and he's absolutely right. Again, this is a different situation in environments where there's an undersupply of typefaces. So the important thing is to focus on who demands typefaces and how do things uh, get um, uh, development gets spurned. So I'm going to try to talk about typefaces from a supply and demand side. And my starting point is that typeface design space, what you can produce is the supply. Uh, whereas people who use your typefaces, document designers, um, web developers and so on, they're the demand side. And if the two don't connect, then you're just doing things in the blind. Now, uh, this uh, has been seen in many cases where we've seen developments in technology succeeding or not because they aligned with the demand or not. So we had technologies for fonts on the, on the web long before we had a big wave of adoption, and that had to do with the demand by the document makers, in that case browsers, essentially shifting their behavior and pushing for the adoption of web fonts. It was not a significant change by the typeface designers. In fact, the typeface design community uh, hurried quite quickly to adapt to what was um, a, a definite development by the browsers in introducing fonts uh, on the web. Uh, and I have to say, uh, it's just one example of many. So what we've seen is that over the years of typeface design, typeface design have generally not been very good at actually reading the demand for typefaces. So the business model for most of typeface design is one of speculative design. You make stuff and you put out in the market, you have a market stall and you put things on your table and you hope that the passers-by will get the correct thing. And at one end of the market, sort of things like uh, my fonts, this is very much how these things operate. They are essentially market stalls where there's an oversupply of things and there's simple mechanisms for people to attract attention. Uh, this can also be seen in what has been enabled increasingly with easier tools. And I've been very mindful in showing any examples of type because I don't want people to think that any example I'm showing is that one that I'm talking about. I'm just using these as avatars for other things. But these ideas of extremely wide families with 11 million variants, because you can do now easily you know, 14 weights and 14 widths and everything in between, is not actually a very efficient 
way of meeting demand. It's just an easy way to fill your table in the marketplace with a lot of different things, hoping that people will actually find the bit that they want. Again, from a business intelligence point of view, that is not very good. There is a problem there because we often don't have the connection with uh, the data that we would need from document makers to query what it is that they really need or they really use. But actually, as a business strategy, this is very high risk and it's not very efficient because a lot of these times will never get used. And if you think that each of these might have a lot of glyphs in them that will never get used, that's a lot of time shifting outlines or quality assuring fonts or making sure that they are properly supported. So the important thing is to go back to uh, the demand and try to see how does demand change. The easiest way to look at this is to look at who uses these things. Try to guess which are the communities, which are the people, and what drives their choices. And again, if you look at the, the basic categories of communities of users, the top one is the supply side. This is sort of people in the room that make stuff. And then everything below it is really the demand side. And the document designers might be an explicit kind of demand because they say, I want this typeface for this kind of document. But distributors are a filter in the demand because they prioritize certain things or certain ways of distributing stuff. So even if you supply something that is available, it gets filtered by distribution channels. And then you have increasingly the community of users with choice. Now, this is something that is happening on screen-based documents that didn't happen before. In a sense, print typography is a dictatorship of the designer. This is what you're going to read, this typeface, this size, no choice. Deal with it. Everybody will read 12 point, whether you are 24 or 54, and your eyesight is very different. Whereas now you have the opportunity to change the typeface size, maybe you can change the typeface style, maybe have preferences in how elaborate uh, the interface is in terms of the range of, uh, of typefaces using, and this is growing quite drastically. So it's an unexplored area of demand that we haven't yet learned how to query and figure out how to meet. So if you're thinking about the design space, you need to figure out how to align this thing that we, sort of, this community supplies, design space, with what people need. Now here's an interesting problem and where the word form comes in, because this has to do with behavior and language. Uh, humans are pretty disappointing creatures when it comes to our imagination. We're not very good. Uh, we're pretty linear. Uh, our word is very analog and constrained. So we can think very easily that way because we're used to thinking on a plane. So uh, a continuum that is a slider or a dial is built in an experience. That is easy to explain. OK, I can do that. Uh, if I introduce another axis, Things get a little bit more complicated, but I can sort of visualize this thing. Again, this is within my experience. I can sort of figure out that I've got two weighted variables and I've got something to work. And this is what most of the stuff that is out there actually meets. You have a, sim a simple intellectual model for how to navigate this design space. If I introduce a third axis, I immediately have a problem because I'm now thinking in sort of three dimensions and I've got the problem of visualizing them in two dimensions. Now, uh, this thing that says to here actually is floating somewhere in space, and that is something that some people might not have the ability to visualize as well as others. Footnote, if you want to really get confused, try to read how physicists try to explain multidimensional space in their publications. Because there's problems that you need X number of dimensions in order to explain another number of dimensions. So if I've got a four-dimensional space, I might need at least three dimensions to explain it. If I've got a seven-dimensional space, how will I make a diagram that shows it? It's completely messed up. And it shows you that our imagination exhausts itself very quickly. This is not a problem if I've got a font with two sliders. It's a real problem if I've got with 11 sliders, because then essentially I've got an 11-dimensional space how will I represent this? Yeah? I don't have the imagination, I don't have the mental tools for it, I certainly don't have the education from my environment to try to imagine something like that. So I thought, uh, okay, let's see what's going on. So uh, I went to Nick Sherman's very useful um, sort of listing of typefaces that have a lot of uh, variable fonts. Uh, and I did a little audit. 
Uh, most of the stuff is weight, and that makes sense, because it's, it's, this is the obvious axis. We're thinking, this is the slider that I'm first thinking of. And width, okay, this is what's going on. There's this smattering of people thinking about optical size, which is interesting, and I think this is the hidden gem in the whole variable fonts thing, uh, at first instance, that the optical size will be the most interesting immediate development in this. And then people are sort of playing, are doing some weird stuff uh, with all sorts of crazy things, but just a couple of things, uh, demonstrations. I'm also ignoring um, the person who did the poop font, um, and I'm also ignoring this thing, uh, like Amstelvar and Decovar and so on, for two reasons. First of all, because they are demo fonts. They're not expected to sell. They are completely isolated from the business environment. This is David Berlo saying, let's see what you could possibly do. So on one level, it's really intended to just reframe your imagination. The other problem is you're not David Berlo. Yeah? Uh, so this is a no these are normal distributions. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. And we have, might have some exceptional skills, which might be towards the top end of the range in something, but they usually balance out because we tend to be pretty poor in something else. Yeah? Uh, so David Berlow might be right at the top of the scale in his imagination uh, ability in terms of how you could express a font and how to produce it. He might be pretty poor in something else. Yeah? Uh, most of us are in the middle. Because David Berlow can do it doesn't mean we can do it. Yeah? That's Peter Sagan. So I could buy that bike. There's no way I can ride the Paris-Roubaix like he does. Yeah? This creates this interesting problem of visualization. Uh, what is interesting to me is also how do you explain things when you have more um, notches in the dial. So you've got CSS coming out and saying we've got mm, from 100 to 900, a continuous scale of weight whereby now you could essentially define anything you want. Uh, that's linear, that's easy. Uh, but a variable font might mean that at any specific point, I might spin off one branch and say, oh, now I'm going to have a completely different axis that I'm going to call, I don't know, interestingness. And in that way, I'm going to spin off a variable. Yeah? And then I'm picking something else there, and I'm spinning off another variable. So I could have essentially a tree structure for my family. And I'm already running into problems with visualizing this because I don't have enough space to do it and I don't have a visual language. And of course, some of you are thinking, hold on, that's half the story, because what I'm still talking there is a font level variation. Actually, with variable fonts, I could have a glyph level variation. So each of these lines is actually however many glyphs you have in a font, and each of these things could have a separate branch. So I'm really now operating in an environment where the design space is by default, way bigger than my ability to imagine it, not just my ability to do something with it. And I have problems. Uh, here's another thing with a normal distribution. Eric's ability to imagine this thing and do it is an example of the problem of a design space that some people might be able to make use of it or explore it, but there's no way to visualize exactly what this means. And at the, at the bottom says, what's going on here? I've got no idea how to navigate this thing. Yeah? Uh, so again, there's this interesting example where you have an environment where I have a, a very rich design space, potentially way bigger than any one of us can imagine, or it can do pretty much anything you want, yeah? with not too much effort. That's the interesting thing. But then you have the problem of explaining what it does and why. And of course, you have to explain it not to fellow designers, like David or Eric do, there, but to actually your customers, or the, the document designers, who we know very well can't even tell two Gs apart. For those of you paying attention to the news recently, yes. So that's your audience, and they don't know which way the G looks like, and you're trying to talk to them about the fine refinements you can make in a, a glyph. So that's an interesting problem. So maybe a lot of our language for fonts is wrong. It's based on this old analog idea of dials and so on. And what we need to do is storyboard a font. Maybe we need to go and look at how people who tell stories about things explain stuff. Yeah. Uh, how do people who animate um, stories explore the potential of a shape and so on. Now, uh, 
there's interesting cases uh, where people are exploring design spaces. There's some guys from underwear in, in the audience, which is really interesting because underwear really get the potential of the space to show how far you can push something uh, given certain starting points. Now, there's interesting examples where people might say, here's all our A's that we've made, and here's a way to navigate across them. Now, this might give you the impression that you have an infinity of A's there, but in reality, you have a, a, a design space that is defined already by pre-existing start points, the existing A's. How do you explain to your clients how do you make use of this potential and what it means to the documents that they are making is something that is quite a difficult challenge. So my, uh, my counter argument to where can we, how far can we go, is that the discussion of the design space is a rabbit hole that is a misdirection. It is perhaps something that takes us down the wrong direction, exactly because it has typeface designers talking about typeface designers with typeface designs about how cool typeface design can be. Yeah which is fun, but it doesn't pay the rent. Yeah. Uh, instead, what you need to go is take a step back and go back again, see the demand side, see how the users who will make use of your fonts require things. So maybe what you need to do is try to see what is it that people are really looking at. They're looking at relationships of styles. So if you have any kind of document, you might have, from the document designer's point of view, say four different hierarchies that need to have certain distance between them. So for them, the thing that says heading or subheading need to have a certain visual impact in terms of difference. And if you talk to document designers, what they most do is design documents having these relationships in mind. They will choose typefaces not based on the specifics of the outlines, but on the relationship of the weight uh, or the styles within the family. So they will rip out uh, test documents that will allow them to see how bold is the bold, what's the difference between the medium and the bold, and so on. So once you have these kind of relationships, you might realize, oh, essentially what I need to do this thing is a family that has at least four discrete steps with that much difference of darkness between them for that kind of document. That's a specification for formal relations between things, which means that even though I can have an infinite granularity in my dial for the font weights, what I want is actually clear steps between. We've also seen this, again with a historical uh, example, when multiple masters were made available to designers, that often designers didn't know very well how to choose what they wanted. That giving graphic designers, document designers, discrete steps of choices with names that they can identify and connect to the specific uses is something useful. Uh, Well-judged limitations actually increase productivity for them rather than uh, be seen as limitations. We also see similar things in new kinds of documents. So a lot of the speculative supply of new typeface design is exactly because the kinds of documents we are using are changing. So that drives a lot of the demand for new typefaces. And that has to do with people reading a lot of structured documents, uh, documents with a lot of hierarchy, on relatively narrow displays. That explains why there is a growth, for example, in relatively narrow text typefaces, and especially in narrow sans serif typefaces. So a recalibration of what is regular is gradually happening because we're looking at things in narrow windows, and therefore, that will allow us to hyphenate text better. So what we think of as regular is gradually narrowing and recalibrating our idea. Now, nobody took a decision to do this. But essentially, designers of documents are slowly voting with their feet by choosing slightly narrower weights. Typeface designers at some point read this demand. They provide more typefaces that have more variations along the condensed, compressed, and so on range. So essentially, you see a gradual thinning of the width of the fonts. You also see more granularity in the different weights, exactly because we read documents that have much more hierarchy rather than very long elements of prose. So once you have these things, what you can do? You can think, okay, I don't really care that I have an infinite design space. What I can do is think of which bits in my design space are the sweet spots of enough difference between the weights that I need to get. 
So if I parse specific kinds of documents, newspapers, magazines, different kinds of editorial design, chat forums, and so on, I will see that I need X number of different kinds of content in my hierarchy with so much potential of difference, visual difference. And then that gives you some sweet spots. Uh, then you can run some tests, like the most uh, David Jonathan Ross run uh, last year, with compression. Now that brings the community of the distributors in. So then you can say, here's how I'm going to plan my typeface design. I'm going to think about the required number of levels of hierarchy that need to be discreetly identified in a document and served by one typeface family, and cross-reference this with the most efficient uh, design of the typeface that will produce the smallest file. Because you can design a typeface to maximize the combinations of weights so that a variable font file will be much more efficient when you ship it as a web font. So what you have then is something that makes use of the desires of the distribution community, the desires of the document design community, and allows you also to narrow down your perception of the design space. The design space is now not something completely shapeless and open, but it's something that allows you to figure out the optimum balance between a technical requirement, which is the most efficient compression, and a typographic requirement, which is the minimum levels of hierarchy that the document designer needs. And once you have these two, you can sort of figure out essentially how to plan your typeface, and then you avoid this very speculative kind of design. The area where this is most interesting, and maybe we need the, another acronym for this, is in things that have very large character sets, where the distribution is really uh, limited by mostly cellular mobile technologies. Again, uh, if you step outside Europe, where we have it's a, we're a small continent with fairly good uh, broadband connections at home and a lot of us have laptops or desktops at home, you step outside, you realize that most people consume most content on some large mobile phone. Uh, you go into Asia, everybody has a phone stuck in their hand. It's usually the larger model, and there's a cable running to an external battery because it's on all the time. It really is on all the time, and it's the main channel for consuming content. So serving complex scripts uh, on a cellular connection on a phone becomes business critical for anybody who produces content. If you want to do your e-commerce in China, it has to work on that phone. If you want to you know, rent your bike, it has to work on the phone, and so on. So if you have something that transforms the ability to compress sufficiently differentiated typefaces that cover global scripts, uh, through this technology, then you've got something that is a business proposition that meets a very clear document demand, a very clear distribution need, and there's a ready community waiting for this to happen. There is a difference there, because in the West we tend to think of typeface designers driven very much by the design, the design of the typefaces. It's the supply side of the argument. I think if we are getting more serious from, for the design of business, the design of uh, type design business, we need to step back and really look at the other communities. Look at document makers, look at distributors, look at patterns of use, and interrogate the kinds of documents that people read typographically and see what this tells us about the typeface that we need to design rather than the ones that we want to design. Uh, and I will leave you with this thought, that go and look at typography, Try to find out what it is that makes the business of documents work and bring that consideration into your type work. And that might be a better business plan than trying to speculatively guess what people will want to design. Thank you very much.